Okay, so continuing with lecture 17, let's solve this problem. So uh, once again, we have the joint PDF. And it's defined on the box. X goes from 0 to 5. Y goes from 0 to 3. And the question we're asked is, what is the probability y is greater than or equal to x? The key to this problem is identifying the region y greater than or equal to x and setting up the integral to calculate the probability. So the key to a region like this is that you draw the line where you have y equals x. So this is y equals x. And now the region of interest is, is here, where if this is the line where y equals x, then y greater than x is the region above the line. Because this is the line y equals x, then this point is the point 3, 3, because we know at that point that y equals 3, and we also know that x has to equal y. And so in some way, we can do this problem without doing any work. We can say, oh, p of a is equal to the probability that x and y belongs to this shaded region, that triangle region. And it's equal to 1 15th times the area of that triangle. And the area of that triangle is equal to, uh, so this is equal to 1 15th times, well, excuse me times one half the base, which is three, times the height, which is three. And so it's equal to nine over 30, which I think is equal to 0 0.3. But this technique works because the density is uniform, but sometimes there'll be homework problems and, and more complicated PDFs that are not uniform over the region. And you'll actually have to set up an integral to solve this. So to set up an integral, you write p of a is equal to the integral over the region a, the joint PDF of x and y dx dy. And this integral is, uh, if you're good at calculus, this is pretty easy. And if you're not so good at calculus, it's good to review. So uh, we're going to do this integral in the following way. We're going to uh, do an outer integral over y from 0 to 3. And then we put in the inner integral of of x and and this is where things get a little bit tricky so the outer integral is going from 0 to 3 and what we're doing is for each value of y we're going to integrate a slice of x going this way so in fact x is going to go from 0 to this corner point and this corner point is x, where x equals y. So x is going to go from 0 to y. And now you write in the PDF, and you write dx and dy. And so this is equal to 0 to 3. And in the inner integral, we get x over 15, 0 to y, and dy, we get 0 to 3. I think I'll, uh, uh, and then we get 
y over 15 dy. And then this is equal to y squared over 30 from 0 to 3. And then we get 9 over 30 equals 0 0.3. However, the, the key to this problem is knowing how to set up this integral right, to correspond to an integral over a triangular region. If you haven't done that recently, you'll need to do it because we have lots of problems like this. So here is the same calculation as it's presented in the book. And I'll just emphasize that, in fact, there are many ways to set up this integral. For instance, you could have done that written that uh, p of a is equal to the integral 0 to 3. And this will be an integral over x. And then you can do an integral over y. And the integral over y, if x is going to go from 0 to 3, here's a value of x. And the integral over y would be over this slice. And so the integral starts at y equals x and goes up to y equals 3. And then you write the joint PDF, which is 1 15th. And you write dy. And then you write dx. So this integral would be equal to 0 to 3 integral x to 3, 1 15th dy dx. And this should give exactly the same answer we had before. But in fact, it's uh, surprisingly a little bit complicated because now we have an integral 0 to 3, and we have y over 15 from x to 3, and then a dx, 0 to 3, and we get uh, uh, 3 minus x, the whole thing over 15 dx. And depending on how good your calculus, you might say, oh, this is 1 half. Uh, maybe minus one half, three minus x squared over 15, evaluated at zero and three. And this equals uh, minus one half, that's one fifteenth. And then you get three minus three squared minus 3 minus 0 squared. And conveniently, this term is 0. And then the minus signs cancel out. And once again, you get 9 over 30, which is the right answer. But uh, doing the integration by first integrating over y and and then having the outer integral be over x is uh, a little more complicated. There's always one way that's easier to do it than the other. OK, so here we have a joint PDF of x and y. And this one is more complicated than a, a uniform example. The joint PDF is equal to cxy. So c is an unspecified constant. And it's over the box region where x goes from 0 to 1 and y goes 0 to 2. We have a region that looks like this. 0 to 2, 0 to 1. Here is x, here is y. And the first thing we want to do is find the constant c. So it is the integral of the joint PDF over all x and y has to integrate to 1. And so we use that. So 1 is the integral uh, for x from 0 to 1 for y from 0 to 2, 
C X Y C Y C X. Right, and this integral separates into an integral over x and an integral over y, 0 to 1 x dx, 0 to 2 y dy. This is equal to c times uh, x squared over 2, evaluated at 0 and 1 times uh, y squared over 2, 0 to 2. So this is equal to c times 1 half. And the second integral is equal to 2 squared over 2, which is 4 over 2. And 4 over 2 is 2. And so the value of the integral c, and c happens to be equal to 1. So in the second part of this problem, we want to find the probability of this event p of a. p of a is that we observe an xy that's uh, in this quarter disk. I mean, the event is defined as xy is in a circle of radius 1 with a circle of radius 1 intersects the disk in this area. So we set up the integral. P of A is the integral over all A of the joint PDF of x and y, dx dy. And so this is the integral over A of c x y dx dy and in principle you could do this integral by uh, properly parameterizing this this border this border here right because the equation for that line is that uh, x squared plus y squared equals 1. And um, in principle, use the technique of the, of, the, of the previous example. But in fact, uh, what you want to do here is to remember that uh, you've taken calculus and you know how to transform a problem like this using polar coordinates. So in terms of polar coordinates, we have that uh, we have that x is equal to r cosine theta, y is equal to r sine theta, and the the volume unit dx dy becomes r dr d theta. And in this case, <coughs> we have that the integral over a. Uh, it becomes an integral of uh, the radius goes from 0 to 1. The theta angle goes from 0 to pi over 2. The constant c is equal to 1. We have r cosine theta. And that's the x. Then the y is r sine theta. And then we have r dr theta. So magically, or because this problem was carefully designed to, to do something nice in polar coordinates, we can separate the integrals of r and theta, and we have, uh, we have 0 to 1 r cubed dr, and 0 to pi over 2 sine theta cos theta d theta. And this integral is 1 fourth r to the fourth from 0 to 1. And this integral, because cos theta is the derivative of sine theta, we have 1 half sine squared theta from 0 to pi over 2.
And so the first integral is equal to one quarter is one minus zero. And the second integral is equal to one half sine squared pi over two, but sine of pi over two is equal to uh, one. And so the whole thing is equal to one eighth. And this indeed is the answer we were looking for. So, uh, so this problem was essentially by construction designed so that uh, if you use the change to polar coordinates, it turns out to be a very simple problem. And this slide just has uh, uh, the algebraic steps that we just did. So now we're pretty good, or we should be once you've practiced, in terms of how to calculate probabilities using a joint PDF. But just like we had for a, a pair of discrete random variables, there are times where you generate a, uh, a pair of continuous random variables, but perhaps you're only interested in one of those random variables. Perhaps all you're interested in is, is random variable x, and its PDF, or maybe you're interested in random variable y and its PDF. So, so in fact, because the joint PDF is a, uh, a complete probability model, we can use that in order to derive the marginal PDFs of x and y. And in fact, uh, what we're doing here is pretty straightforward like to find the marginal PDF of X, we integrate the joint PDF over all Y. Find the marginal PDF of Y, we integrate the joint PDF of X and Y over all X. This theorem is exactly the same as the theorem we had for uh, discrete X and Y, where we use the joint PMF to find the marginal PMFs. Remember, in the discrete case, we had a joint PMF, and we found the marginal by summing the joint PMF over all y for a given fixed x. And similarly, we found the, the PMF of y by summing the PMF, the joint PMF, over all possible x for that fixed value of y. And this is exactly the same. It's just that the, the summation of the joint PMF has been replaced by an integral of the joint PDF. If you're interested in how to prove a theorem like this, you have to start with the CDF of x. Probability x is less than or equal to x and this is a region in the xy plane over which you have to integrate. So you imagine drawing xy plane. Here is a value x. Here x and y. And you have to integrate over this whole region. And so this region is the integral uh, using a dummy variable from minus infinity to x. And then we integrate y from minus infinity to infinity. Joint PDF of x and y. And we'll use dummy variables x prime and y prime. dy prime. And then dx prime. And then the next step is that you to you write the PDF by taking a derivative of this function. Minus infinity to x, minus infinity to infinity f of x, y, x prime, y prime, uh, dy prime, dx prime. And if you're good at this, 
Um, you'll know how to do this where you have both uh, a, a limit of an x and this derivative. And if you're not good at this, well, like it's kind of more calculus that we can teach in this course. But in fact, uh, this integral, this derivative of this integral is in fact exactly equal to the inner integral evaluated at x prime equals x. And here y prime is just the dummy variable. So in fact, we've recovered our main result. And you can do the same thing for y. But in fact, uh, this bit of calculus is maybe something you're not the least bit interested in. And in this case, you should just remember how the theorem of integrating over the joint PDF is exactly analogous to summing over the joint PMF. In both cases, you find a marginal, either a marginal PMF or uh, a marginal PMF or a marginal PDF. So what we just learned is that uh, given the joint PDF function of x and y, uh, that means we can find the marginals fx of x and fy of y. And so you might wonder, um, can you use the marginals to reconstruct the joint PDF of X and Y? And so the answer to that question is, uh, in general, is no. The joint PDF is in fact kind of a complete probability model for our experiment. And, and uh, the marginals are only providing kind of partial information about X and Y. It doesn't describe the way in which they're related to each other. So the PDF of X is a description of random variable X. You can calculate probabilities related to X. PDF of Y is a description of random variable Y. But together, the two marginals don't provide a way to do calculations uh, where you reason about the joint pair X and Y. However, there is one exception to this rule. And that's the case when X and Y are independent. So we've talked about independent events, how learning that event A occurs tells you nothing about uh, event B when they're independent. And now we want to extend that idea to random variables to say that random variables X and Y are independent. Observing a value of random variable X tells you nothing about random variable Y. So here's the definition of independence. And in fact, this is the first example using random variables where we have kind of two definitions in one. We have a definition for the discrete case. In the discrete case, the joint PMF factors into the product of the marginal PMFs. PXY is equal to PX times PY. In the continuous case, you have an exactly analogous result that the joint PDF factors into the PDF of X times the PDF of Y. For discrete random variables, we'll see that this definition implies that the events X equal to little x and Y equal to little y are independent events for all at little x and all little y. And for continuous random variables, what we'll see is that 
the events, for instance, that X belongs to some set A, and that maybe Y belongs to some set B, are independent events. Uh, for all for all sets a and b so so in fact these definitions in terms of pmfs and pdfs of independence say exactly what we would expect them to say uh, learning that random variable x takes on some value or some range of values is uh, doesn't provide any information about the the probability that y takes on some value or set of values. Learning X tells you nothing about that changes your knowledge of the probabilities of Y and vice versa. So there are a variety of homework problems where we ask you to figure out whether X and Y are independent, much like we did in chapter one or two where you asked to find our events A and B independent. And the thing is when you're solving those problems, what you want to do is simply check whether these conditions hold. On the other hand, that's just for, for homework practice. In, in the real world, you don't really uh, use independence in this way. In the real world, what you have is a physical situation. And something about the physical situation tells you that it's a good probability model to assume independence. So for instance, if you uh, if you flip a coin and you uh, roll a dice, right? Like uh, if uh, X is the result of the coin flip, it's zero or one, and uh, Y is the roll of the dice, somehow a good probability model is that uh, the flip of the coin would be independent. It doesn't provide you any information about the roll of the dice. So in that sense, uh, it's logical to assume X and Y are independent. Another example that comes up a lot is uh, when we started this course with it. Uh, for instance, that you, uh, you transmit a signal X, right? And then you receive Y, which is a noisy version. So, so this noise is actually uh, electrons bouncing around in, in your receiver circuitry, and it doesn't have anything to do with the, uh, the signal X that was transmitted to you, which might have something to do with binary bits of an image. And so um, it's very logical uh, for to, to do a probability modeling assumption where the data that's being transmitted X is independent of the noisier receiver generates and decoding the data. So in that sense, um, the usefulness of independence comes from the fact that in various physical situations, uh, it's reasonable to assume in the model that the random variables are independent. We'll see this a lot as we go forward. So this concludes lecture 17, and uh, you should start doing these homeworks because uh, if you're good at calculus, you'll think they're fun. And uh, if you're rusty at calculus, uh, you need to practice because uh, we're going to do a bunch of this.